Uh, and while writing the book, I realized that there's a lot more to our interaction with the environment than biochemicals, you know, than, than the, the chemicals that we uh, inhale or ingest or apply to our skin. There's a lot more that happens to our bodies besides biochemical interactions. And that's kind mm -hmm. of where traditional medicine is. You know, they look at the body as a bag of chemicals. Uh, the problem is that we have energy that's orchestrating those chemicals and the energy is instructing every cell in the body uh, and how to perform. And so that energy can be altered by external sources of energy. Our environment is becoming inundated with human generated electromagnetic fields mm -hmm. and radio frequency radiation, and it is affecting the health of the population. All right, so today I have with me Dr. Rob Brown, a medical doctor trained in radiology out of the University of Miami. Dr. Brown has worked in both private practice as well as in academia, such as the NYU Medical Center and the Cleveland Clinic Foundation. Dr. Brown, I'm excited to have you on the podcast. How are you today? I'm doing well. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for, uh, for interviewing me. Yeah, absolutely. I, I have been wanting to do a podcast on EMF exposure. I know you're also into um, like toxins. You have your, your book. Uh, all about toxin exposure, but uh, I really want to dive deep into the connection between EMF and uh, an immune system, COVID-19 especially. Mm -hmm. I read over, I can't lie and say that I read the entire study. It was a really big study um, titled Evidence for a Connection Between Coronavirus Disease 19 and Exposure to Radio Frequency Radiation from Wireless Communication, including 5G. And I uh, want to dive into that later on in the podcast. But before we get into that, uh, you went from a traditional allopathic route and now to what is considered more of an alternative medicine, you know, to meditation, energy medicine, magnetotherapy. And uh, I also saw that you had a cancer diagnosis, which I'm sure played a role there. So tell me about how that shift happened. Um, the, you know, when you, when you graduate from uh, medical school and a residency training program, you really feel like you know, know it all, at least in your subspecialty. And in radiology, you get to learn about the whole body, at least, at least every part that you can image. So I felt pretty confident about my skill set and my fund of knowledge. And I thought that I really could, could handle most any problem. And if I couldn't handle it, I would know where to refer somebody. Uh, and so I went on a hike. I was planning a trip to Mount Kilimanjaro uh, to, to do uh, some volunteer work in a town called Moshi. And while I was there, I was going to do a trek up and down the mountain. And while practicing and, and preparing for the trip, I went to Mount Rainier with my cousin. And I was hiking down the, the mountain and I stepped wrong on a rock and I twisted my knee. And it blew up almost instantly. I couldn't walk at the be escorted down to, to, our, um, to our cabins afterwards. And my, my cousin had studied in uh, England and she was telling me, oh, why don't you try Arnica? Why don't you try all these alternative remedies? And I thought, oh, I'm not gonna try any of that. I'm gonna go to an orthopedic surgeon uh, when I get back to Pittsburgh and I'm going to get this evaluated. And I was nervous because I had this upcoming trip. So when I got back to Pittsburgh, uh, I went to the orthopedic surgeon. He prescribed Celebrex for me, which was the uh, NSAID of choice at that time. And while I was on the, the medication, the pain got better, but there was still a little bit of a, I, I knew it was still there. And when the, the, uh, the uh, prescription ran out, the pain came back in full force and the orthopedic surgeon said, you know, I think you're gonna have to have arthroscopy. We're gonna have to take a look at that, maybe take the meniscus out. And uh, I thought, there's no way I'm going on this trip to Africa. I was leaving and I think it was maybe a month or six weeks time. So I was working next to this uh, other radiologist and his wife was selling a product called Nikan, which were these magnets from Japan. And he said to me, you know, are you, op are you open-minded? Are you willing to try something, you know, unconventional? And I thought well, right now I'm willing to try anything because mm -hmm. I, I have nothing to lose. So his wife came in and she applied these two magnets to my knee. And uh, I didn't, I really didn't have any hope at all. But when I was going home, I noticed that when I pushed my, the, the clutch in on my car, I didn't feel the twinge of pain that I typically felt. And over the next few days and weeks and, and, and eventually 
it completely healed. I was able to hike Mount Kilimanjaro. I went gorilla trekking in Uganda. I did all these wonderful things that were very uh, strenuous on my knee. And uh, the reason I'm going to this long story is because I couldn't believe, I still, you know, right even now, it's so hard to fathom how these little magnetic discs could heal me. And I really spent a lot of time, what you, you're fascinated with this, how could magnets heal? And uh, I went from that job into a fellowship at University of California in San Diego, where I studied musculoskeletal radiology with the guru of uh, bone and joint imaging. He was really the resource for the entire world. He had, mm. he had people all over the world studying with him. And uh, I was fortunate to be one of his paid fellows, which was, which was very exciting. And I wanted to do research on these magnets, but he, he advised me to stay away from that because it was too controversial. Hmm. It wasn't a good way to start your career to dive into something so controversial as magnets. So I held my breath and I used them for myself and then my family and friends for the past, uh, well, so almost uh, 25 years now. And a, a point came where I decided, you know what, I have to live my truth. I have to be honest in my professional life as well as in my personal life. I, and I felt that being an allopathic physician and just reading diagnostic scans wasn't really helping people in the way that I knew how to help people. Uh, I knew that there were reasons why people were getting sick. There were people, the reasons why people could get better without conventional treatments. And I wasn't sharing that information. Uh, so after my mother passed away, I decided that regardless of the repercussions, I was going to put this out there. I was going to put what I knew to be true uh, out there. And that's why I wrote the book. Uh, and while writing the book, I realized that there's a lot more to our interaction with the environment than biochemicals, you know, than, than the, the chemicals that we uh, inhale or ingest or apply to our skin. There's a lot more that happens to our bodies besides biochemical interactions. And that's kind mm -hmm. of where traditional medicine is. You know, they look at the body as a bag of chemicals. Uh, the problem is that we have energy that's orchestrating those chemicals. And the energy is instructing every cell in the body uh, on how to perform. And so that energy can be altered by external sources of energy. Uh, and so anyway, reading more and more about this, uh, I've just gotten deeper and deeper into it because as you know, our environment is becoming inundated with human generated electromagnetic fields mm -hmm. and radio frequency radiation, and it is affecting the health of the population. Yeah, I mean, I would have to say when I first heard about this, I probably was one of those people that fell into the category of, okay, let me get you a tinfoil hat, you know, like this is crazy stuff, right? But then two years ago, I got kind of red pilled into this whole idea that, well, it's not that crazy, right? Like we are electromagnetic beings, the beating of a heart, the contraction of a muscle, we are, that's our essence, right? Um, and so that happened to me when I listened to Dr. Jack Cruz. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, pretty controversial figure, but a very, very smart guy. Um, and so I listened to some of his work on, you know, light water and magnetism. That's his big thing. And it started to make a lot of sense to me. Then I started to work with the Environmental Health Trust. They're a major resource, right? Excellent. Um, and so, yeah. Can you explain a little bit about how those magnets actually like could, you know, can affect you? The magnets that I the use? Magnets that, yeah, exactly. Um, so they're static magnets as opposed to, uh, you know, uh, pulsed like uh, PEMT, which is a popular treatment now, uh, which also uses magnetic fields. But static magnets, the way they're designed, from what I understand, is the polarity alternates every few millimeters in this disk. And so if you have a charged particle or molecule, such as a water molecule, which is a dipole, it's got a, mag a positive charge and a negative charge on, you know, on each end. If that's moving underneath the magnet, it's being influenced by reversing magnetic fields as it travels. Mm -hmm. And so that causes the molecule to actually shift orientation every couple of millimeters. And what I think is happening is that is loosening up and causing a little bit of jostling of the microcirculation and improving blood flow. Interesting. So it's okay. really, it's not that the magnet is actually healing, it's allowing the body to heal itself. 
That's fascinating. I know uh, some of your work on like your blog posts um, and some interviews that you've had, uh, that's something that you talk about quite a bit in your bio as well, right? It's this idea that you shifted away from, you know, treating um, an ill with a pill and you shifted more towards how can I remove things in your environment that are inhibiting your health and allow your own body to do the work, right? Right. Yeah. Well, certainly there's a role for conventional medicine. I don't want anybody of course. To, this to think that I don't believe in in medication and surgery. Absolutely. Right. There's an, there's definitely a, a use for those things, but they are, they should be the last resort, uh, you know, after you can't heal yourself. Right. So that's yeah. kind of how I, I look at it. And uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's something that to me, I think when I first started to get into health, um, because before that it was, you know, doctors are the you know, at the top of the hierarchy, they know everything about health. And obviously, they're knowledgeable. I mean, I'm not s sitting here saying that it's easy to get into med school and go through that whole process. Of course, it's not. But what they're taught is, is a limited scope, right? It's, it's mostly, it, uh, it's amazing for acute care, right? For infections and for surgeries, they're like, that's amazing, right? We've, we've had so many uh, life saving discoveries with that. Now, where there's a lot of room for growth and a new niche is now emerging is for, you know, preventative care, chronic disease right. care and right. reversal. So yeah, I totally agree with you. Yes. You know, it's tricky because you're, you're then overstepping the realm of medicine, which is traditional to be a, a, a caretaker. Right. It's, it's not to be, uh, to help somebody be well, but to, to prevent them from getting sick. And so you end up overstepping into the realm of industry, into the realm of technology, where there are other people out there who have their expertise uh, and don't want to be told, well, I, I shouldn't, you know, don't tell me that I can't have this product because it's going to make people sick. You know, how, how do you know that? Uh, and so, yeah. you know, all of a sudden it's, you cross uh, lines. And what was interesting about the paper, which we'll discuss, is that it also crosses lines between medicine and biophysics, which yes. is, you know, that's a line that people don't cross. You know, doctors know biology and medicine, they don't know physics. Radiologists right. know some physics. I mean, we were trained in physics uh, for a residency program, but it's, you know, it is a, um, it's one of those lines that, that isn't crossed typically. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I became fascinated with, with the study of, of biophysics a couple of years ago. Um, so let's get right into it. Um, COVID-19 and 5G, there's no easy yeah. way to come out and say that, right? At the beginning <laughs> of the pandemic, I remember I was, you know, working with the, with the Environmental Health Trust at the beginning, and um, they were telling me, oh, this is terrible, because now people are dismissing the legitimate effects of EMFs, because there are these outrageous claims that 5G causes COVID, right? right. And so it's totally taking away from the true, like, biological effects that these things have on our health, right? And so that's why I, I saw your paper and I recently found it and I was like, this is amazing. Like, this is the first study I've actually seen that that is like really being direct and saying, look, there there is a direct effect. Um, so so tell me about, you know, the origins of this paper. Um, I first I first became interested in this topic after learning that electromagnetic fields and radiation, uh, radio frequency radiation in particular can cause the blood to become hypercoagulable. It's a transient phenomenon, but I learned at a conference that I went to, an EMF conference, mm -hmm. that um, in some people, and we don't know how, how uh, prevalent this is, when they're exposed to radio frequency radiation, their blood can go into its blood rouleau formation, where the, the, the electrostatic charge on the red blood cells changes and the red blood cells stick together. And so they, it, it becomes sluggish. It causes sluggish flow. Mm -hmm. um, well, I was reading CAT scans and x-rays in patients that were developing COVID early during the pandemic, and I saw really unusual blood clots. I mean, this was before blood clotting was known to be a problem with COVID patients. And I wrote a blog about it. I said, you know, there's something weird going on here. You know, these, all these patients have these unusual blood clots. I saw a blood clot in the portal vein. I saw a blood clot in somebody's aorta. I saw a blood clot, I mean, places where you don't usually see them. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a lot, it was frequent. So <clears throat> I started thinking, well, gee, I wonder if this, this could be related to this, all this radiation, because if, there's, if the COVID virus is damaging the endothelium 
and the cells were going into a low formation from the from Wi-Fi and from all this radiofrequency radiation, maybe the two were causing the increase in blood clots. It was just an idea, something I wanted right. to throw out there as a, what would be appropriate blood content, not a scientific paper. Right. But it was picked up and translate, you know, sent around the, the uh, a lot of contacts internationally. And I was contacted by a team that was working on as, you know, other, other things that might be causing uh, exacerbation of the disease uh, related to radiofrequency radiation. And I was asked to participate in this group. And over the, the course of the, the, the research, two of the people dropped out. And so I was left with, with the biophysicist who was leading the investigation. And so she and I, you know, completed it and wrote the paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, you know, like I said, to me, this this idea that wireless radio frequency radiation from you know cell phones, you know other devices, um, you know Wi-Fi router routers, and even like the low level EMF from like power lines, um, that was pretty new to me. But uh, you know, once once I once I started working with the Environmental Health Trust uh, these two years ago, that's when it was like you know there definitely seems like there's some overlap between the effects that these things have on our immune system. Right. And, you know, what's going on with COVID, like you mentioned the, you know, the, the blood cell aggregation. Um, right. So that was the first thing that we looked at. And then we, yeah. we, we investigated the immune system and we found papers that showed that uh, radiofrequency radiation can inhibit macrophages and they can uh, cause natural killer cells to stop functioning properly, which is a very important cell in the immune system. It can affect lymphocytes. Uh, initially, exposure to, to this type of radiation can cause lymphocytes to become hyperactive and, and overstimulated. But then over time, they kind of develop this learned helplessness uh, uh, attitude from psychology where they, they, don't, they stop performing as well. And so you become immunosuppressed. They're, these are not dramatic effects, but they're enough that if you have a disease such as COVID, it might put you into the realm of uh, a worse prognosis. Uh, and what was really concerning, of course, is that when people go into the hospitals now, all this monitoring equipment is wireless. And so mm -hmm. it's all communicating wirelessly to the nursing stations. So, and so right. the patients, they're trying to heal and they're being bombarded with radiation. And so the body's trying to fight off the radiation in addition to the disease. And uh, we noticed that patients that were admitted to the ICU had a worse outcome. Of course, it's, you know, you can't you can't come down and say, oh, well, it's because of the wireless. I mean, that's, that would right. just not be reasonable. But right. we wanted to raise as an issue in our paper as you know, something that should be looked at. Yeah, yeah, no, and, and some of the hospitals I know near me have you know, 5G routers right on top of the, of yeah. the hospital, right? So it's, yeah. Um, yeah, it's happening over schools. It's happening um, closer and closer now because that's what 5G is gonna be. It's gonna be closer and closer centers of, of radiation. Right, so most people don't really understand what 5G that is. They hear it's you know 5G and they just think it's this package. <laughs> right. But it really is an enormous bandwidth of radiation. And uh, just for your listeners um, to understand the very basic physics of this, uh, at one end of the spectrum, let's say we have light and at the other we have the waves you get from power lines which is like 50, 60 Hertz, depending on what country you live in. So everywhere, all these wavelengths in between uh, is part of what's considered the, the electromagnetic spectrum. Above visible light, we have, you know, it continues, but I'm just saying between light, because mo most people understand that light won't penetrate through a wall, for example, mm -hmm. but radio waves do. And Wi-Fi, of course, does. I mean, you know, when you turn on your device and you say, well, what network can I join? You're seeing a list of networks from all of your neighbors. It's obviously the Wi-Fi is going through their house, through their walls, the exterior of their house, through the exterior of your house, and through your walls into whatever you're holding. So the, the longer the wavelength, which means the shorter the frequency, or the... the um, the lower the frequency, the longer the wavelength, the lower the frequency, the greater the depth of penetration. So that's kind of how, but as you increase frequency and you uh, decrease the wavelength, the, 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 the um, radiation has a higher intensity. So it has 
has more power. It can potentially right. do more damage. It's, that hasn't been proven. Right. We don't really know what each of these wavelengths does, but the physics says that as you increase the frequency and decrease the wavelength, the intensity of the radiation increases, but the depth of penetration decreases. Mm -hmm. So you, we have all these 5G towers and installations going up everywhere. The reason they're so frequently spaced is because yes, the, the radiation doesn't travel as far and the industry is creating a higher power density. The, the radiation has a much higher amplitude so that it can force its way through your home which also means it could force its way through your body, the higher frequencies. I mean, we got to just, you know, put that into perspective. Um, it doesn't mean it's going to go through all of your body at the same intensity because we have bones, we have gas in our stomach, we have fat cells. And so the attenuation of the beam varies depending on what it's going through. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's kind absolutely. of like an x-ray. If you take an x-ray of a person, which is ionizing radiation, it's a different, it's a much higher intensity, but it's still electromagnetic radiation. It's still the same spectrum. You shoot that through a body to very high intensity, the bones are going to attenuate the beam much more so than say gas in the lung. And that's why we can see, we see the discrepancy in absorption on an X-ray. And that's, that's what we're actually interpreting when we look at an X-ray. Right. So the same thing is happening with radio frequency radiation, I believe even though it has been presented that way. And yeah. just again, just one. So mm -hmm. just to also uh, to, to just ex, um, explain how dramatic the bandwidth is of 5G. If you, do you remember the old radios where you had like an AM, an analog, mm -hmm. you know, dial and you would turn the radio, you yeah. know, the dial on the radio from AM, you would maybe do five or six twists and you'd be from one end of the bandwidth to the other. Yes. How, mu how much bigger do you think the 5G spectrum is, the bandwidth? How much larger is the spectrum of 5G compared to, say, the AM bandwidth? Uh, I'd say quite a bit bigger. 85,000 times. Wow. And, and what kind of, what are we talking about in terms of effects of that large bandwidth? Like, what, what does that do? We don't know. Okay. The research hasn't been done. Uh, but, you know, with biological systems, you have something called resonance, you have, um, you, you have, uh, you know, some frequencies resonate with certain molecules, certain structures. And so as you change the frequency, the effects can be different. Mm, okay. And it depends on the intensity, because it depends on how close you are to the source. It depends if there are other sources infiltrating you at the same time. It's it's like diving into the ocean and not knowing where you're going. That's what that's what we've done. We've created an ocean of electromagnetic fields, and we don't know what they're all doing to us. Yeah. So to quickly summarize here, see if I'm I'm getting this right. So three G, well two G, three G, four G was a a longer wavelength, a shorter frequency, and so it had less energy that it carried with it, um, but it penetrated us more deeply. Whereas with five G, it's higher frequency, higher energy, more power. Is that right? Right. So the 2G, 3G, 4G, they had a, a, um, a lower frequency. Right. They were lower down in the spectrum than 5G is going all the way up to the same frequency as we use for radar. Right. Uh, and so there's millimeter waves, there's microwaves. I mean, you can refer to the waves in terms of their wavelength, like millimeter waves or microwaves or by the, the frequency. So right. it doesn't really matter there. It's, it's interchangeable. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so the big appeal here is that it's that it's faster. Right. But we just it hasn't been safety tested enough. So we don't really know what we're dealing with. Right. So, uh, you know, for example, if you have a microwave oven, that's 2.45 gigahertz, uh, 2.45 gigahertz. So that's the right. same frequency that your router is. Okay. But there's a difference. OK, so we know that that can cook food. Right. That, yes. that frequency, if you have a high enough intensity, will cook food. And that's how this industry is regulated. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an, an organization called ICNERP and they came up with uh, a certain value for, um, for the absorption uh, of this radiation. It's called the SAR value, the SAR value. So what that means is they, they're limiting the amount that you are allowed to absorb uh, 
and it's based on a phantom. It's not based on human studies or it's based on a phantom that looks like the shape of a head and they fill it with a certain type of fluid. It's not, mm -hmm. the phantom doesn't have a skeletal structure or cartilage or anything. It's not, it's not really a realistic uh, model for a human right. head. But regardless, they use this phantom to determine, well, how much radiation is going to be absorbed? And at what point are we gonna start increasing the temperature of the tissues and have a, what's a heating effect? That's, that's, that's what they're looking for with regulation. What, you know, have, we want to lower the radiation to make sure we don't cause a significant heating effect. Mm -hmm. uh, because we know that heating can cause proteins to denature, enzymes start, uh, stop functioning, we can have cell death and all kinds of things happen. Uh, so that's where, uh, that's where the, um, the regulation comes in. But what they're not taking into account is what I consider stochastic events, which when you talk about ionizing radiation, you're talking about the same type of things. You have deterministic effects where you can get a burn uh, and it's predictable. So uh, I guess I'm jumping around here, I'm sorry. Is no worries, okay? no worries. Yeah, all good. Okay, so for ionizing radiation, if you have a certain amount of exposure, you know you're gonna get a burn and you can calculate how bad the burn is gonna be based on your exposure. That's called a deterministic effect. Okay, it's kind of like the same deterministic effect as putting food in the microwave oven or putting a cell phone against your head. You know you're going to feel the warmth of the cell phone if you put it against your head because it's generating heat and you can calculate that the degree of increase in temperature. That's a deterministic effect. Right. With radiation, ionizing radiation, you can also get cancer. You can also get thyroid disease. You can get all these other diseases, but they don't happen in everybody. And depending on your exposure, it can almost seem like it's random. Hmm. But as you increase exposure, more and more people become affected, right? right? So that's called stochastic. And it was because of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, where we had such a huge population exposed to ionizing radiation that we were able to determine, well, if you were this far away from the blast site, then your risk for developing thyroid cancer, for example, would it be X. Got it. If you were that distance, you would be, it would be Y. <laughs> And so we calculated the danger, you know, the exposures that were considered dangerous for developing cancer with mm -hmm. ionizing radiation. And we developed standards and regulations. So now you can't go into a shoe store and have your feet x-rayed, for example. I mean, we, mm -hmm. people used to go into a shoe store and have their feet x-rayed to make sure that the shoe fit properly. It sounds <laughs> crazy, right? Yeah. People, people used to actually uh, buy radium water water that was infused with radioactive radium and they would drink it as a health tonic and they would get some of them would get cancer but it was still it was not regulated this was not a regulated industry until yeah. after there was unde undeniable proof that this caused cancer so yeah i look at non-ionizing radiation and this radio frequency radiation as the same thing there are deterministic effects and there are stochastic effects the problem that we have is that most of the world now is being infiltrated with these frequencies and we don't mm -hmm. have a control. Right. Right. Yeah. There's no way to do a double blind placebo controlled randomized like this is just not possible. Right. Everyone's a guinea pig. Right. And so, yeah. you know, I look I look back to my past and, you know, people who are older can say, well, I remember what, was like, what life was like back in the early 90s or the 80s. I remember what, pe you know, what diseases people had. Yeah. I remember how many people had pacemakers, for example. Mm -hmm. I remember that nobody had celiac disease. Not that's related to EMF, it's something else. But there were diseases that were much less prevalent in the 80s and the 90s than they are now. And, you know, you start to wonder, gee, is this related to the electropollution that we've created? Right. Yeah. And, you know, this was a major topic um, of interest to me when I first started researching for my book, because uh, I, I wanted to really put a comprehensive guide together of what are all of these things that contributed to worsened COVID outcomes and what are the things that you can control? And EMF obviously was one chapter, one entire chapter dedicated to that. And the first really counter argument I heard was, well, you know, this is this is crazy that this could have an effect on us because this is non-ionizing radiation, right? It can't break your DNA directly, right? right. But uh, on the other hand, you have the ionizing, which is what you, you spoke about, the x-rays, right? Which, which have enough energy to actually break through the DNA, right. can cause mutations, can cause cancer, right? And so that was the first thing that was like, 
Hmm, well, that, well, that's interesting. Like, how then could it possibly be deleterious? And one of the researchers I came across was Dr. Martin Paul, who right. talked about the, um, you know, calcium, intracellular calcium being something that can cause more uh, oxidative stress, more inflammation. And so it can be an indirect way of causing that. But uh, what you're saying, I mean, the regulation was just based off of, of heating and it wasn't taking into account all those indirect negative effects. Right. They, they, right. They, the, the idea of uh, the intracellular calcium has been known for a long time. Dr. Paul didn't actually, wasn't the first person to observe that. Okay. That there's an increased intracellular calcium in cells that are exposed to radiofrequency radiation. But what Dr. Paul did notice is that if you gave somebody or you applied a calcium channel blocker, you know, that people take, say, for heart disease, right, that it ameliorates the effect. And he then put two and two together and said, oh, well, you know, these, these calcium channels must be being activated by the radiation mm -hmm. and they're allowing calcium to flow into the cell. Right. And that's what's happening. So it, you have excess intracellular calcium and then your, your, your cells react by producing nitrous oxide. And then mm -hmm. that can, it can, it, depending, I mean, you need to have some reactive oxygen species in your cell to, to ward off organisms, there's, there's certain organelles in, in the cell that will actually, you know, compile them and keep them together so that mm -hmm. if the cell wants to kill itself, it can, or if it's going to destroy a bacterium or something, it can, it can be useful, uh, uh, a useful chemical for the body, but if it, if it goes uncontrolled, mm -hmm. then the cell goes into what's called oxidative stress because these chemicals, and there's three that they talk about, there's hydroxyl radicals, there's hydrogen peroxide, and a molecule called superoxide. And so these three, they have a negative charge, and so they're looking to become stabilized, and so they're looking for electrons from another source to, uh, um, I mean, is that, is that like, but when they, in the case, they're looking for electrons, and they, they take an electron from your DNA or from your cell membrane, from your mitochondrion, and wherever they're taking the electrons from can then become damaged because it, mm -hmm. it creates a cascade of events. So that's where they're thinking that the effects are, are generated from. It's from the oxidative stress that results from an excess of intracellular calcium. Now with COVID, what was also interesting about this is that the virus can also activate those channels and allow for excess intracellular calcium. Uh, viral replication, the binding and, 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 uh, and replication of, of, of the virus is accentuated with intracellular calcium. And also, I came across an article that showed that viral mutation is also accentuated uh, or accelerated in the presence of excess intracellular calcium. So, you know, of all these mutations, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's curious. Is it being accelerated because of all the EMF? I don't know. Right. But, uh, Right. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And I know there's some, there was some emerging research. I can't remember the exact date, but I'll, I'll link to the, to the study um, that showed that magnesium is actually a, a natural calcium channel blocker. So, I mean, could it have been used preventatively? You know, maybe um, I think especially because it's quite safe and because, you know, we're not really getting a lot of it in the diet anymore. It was probably a good idea to mention magnesium intake for that. Right. Now, I told people, I wrote up, before COVID became a pandemic, I was, I, I sent out a newsletter to my uh, subscribers and I said, you know, just in case, like, don't panic, <laughs> but just in case this starts spreading and comes to a neighborhood near you, these are what you should do. You know, this is what you should do. Right. Take antioxidants. And because I knew COVID causes oxidative stress. And so just like EMF, I told people, you know, increase your, uh, your ingestion of antioxidants, whether you get it from fruits and vegetables or you take vitamin C, make sure you have a, a, enough vitamin D on board. You know, all the, we, we're all familiar with antioxidants now. Right. Um, but yeah, that helps because the antioxidants donate electrons. Mm. And so we're having this, you know, in the cell, you've got all this oxidative stress going on from the Wi-Fi and from COVID you feed yourself electrons from these uh, antioxidants and uh, it can, it can help. It can help. Right. Right. Are, are there any, well, first, before I ask if there are any studies which directly look at, um, you know, Wi-Fi exposure and uh, you know, your, your risk of severe COVID and the COVID outcomes, um, 
are the main mechanisms, um, the increased oxidative stress and, you know, the blood coagulation, or are there others that are also important? There were others that we also looked at. Uh, okay. One was the effect on the heart because mm -hmm. electromagnetic fields and radiation, and frequency radi radio frequency radiation can cause arrhythmias. Okay. And they can affect the heart muscle, they can affect the, uh, the um, AV node. And so, you know, there's, that was a real problem with COVID patients was they'd go into atrial fibrillation. Uh, so co that was another kind of overlap where it could be that it was exacerbating that tendency. Um, we also looked at, um, uh, and we talked about intracellular calcium, oxidative stress, and the immune system dysfunction. The other thing about the immune system that we didn't talk about in the paper, but I came across subsequently is that the thyroid gland, which is known to be very radiosensitive uh, in, in x-ray departments, we always wear a thyroid shield, or at least we're mm. supposed to if you're handling, uh, if you're putting your foot on the floral machine, uh, the thyroid gland is very radiosensitive and it, it's only like five or six millimeters deep in some people. Mm -hmm. And so radio frequency radiation of any wavelength is going to penetrate the thyroid gland and I came across many studies that showed either hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism that could result from uh, Wi-Fi exposure. And I had an example in my own house, uh, which if you want to hear, my sister had uh, was diagnosed with hyperthyroidism a number of years ago. And uh, she was referred to an endocrinologist who offered her a thyroidectomy or a radioactive iodine ablation, which is the two treatments that are most commonly offered. And she called me and said, what do you think I should do? And I said, uh, I, I was very upset because it just seemed like everybody was being diagnosed with hyperthyroidism a number of years ago. And I, I don't do that much uh, inpatient or, or clinic work anymore. I'm mainly doing ER stuff, so I don't come across it anymore. Mm -hmm. But uh, at the time I was doing just a regular a general radiology job. So I said to her, uh, you don't have your Wi-Fi router in your bedroom, do you? I, I was just trying to think of what be causing your thyroid to be elevated. And she said, yes, it's in, it's in my bedroom. And I said, well, I want you to move the Wi-Fi router into the basement and uh, check your levels again in three or four months. Let's just see if that makes a difference. So she talked to her endocrinologist about what my suggestion was, and he thought it was a wacko. Uh, but she was stubborn and said, you know, I'm going to do it because my brother, yeah. you know, I, I trust him. So she put the, uh, the Wi-Fi router in the basement and she turned it off at night before she went to sleep and her thyroid normalized. She went back for repeat testing a few months later, thyroid levels were normal and they remained normal for years and years and years until recently when she just moved into a, a, a 55 plus community and she moved into a room uh, and on the, on, the, uh, on the other side of the common wall, the lady had a Wi-Fi router and she ended up with hyperthyroidism again. So now she's sleeping within a shielding canopy to block the Wi-Fi, and uh, I, I'm just gonna, she's waiting to get retested. But it's a direct correlation in her case. That's fascinating. Okay, so we left off talking about uh, hyperthyroidism, and I wanted to ask you if if is this also the case for hypothyroidism? Like, is it possible for for EMF to possibly lead to that? Yes. Well. Uh, the, the thyroid gland, remember we're talking about uh, with the immune system that it can be initially hyperstimulated and then hypostimulated. The same thing can happen with the thyroid gland. Got it. If you have thyroid, uh, what's called thyroiditis, where the thyroid becomes inflamed and it's kind of on alert, mm -hmm. uh, you end up producing too much thyroid and you become hyperthyroid. But then the gland kind of dies back. Not, it doesn't die back, but it stops functioning normally, and then you can become hypothyroid. God. But regardless, uh, regardless of your hypo or hyper, it can either can affect your heart, which is another reason why uh, people might be going into uh, atrial fibrillation or ventricular fibrillation is also associated with uh, thyroid disorders. So everything's, every, all the systems are uh, intertwined. Right. It's very hard to separate out one from the other, but yes, the thyroid gland, whether it's hyper or hypo, can affect the immune system and can it also affect your heart rhythm. Okay, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. 
Um, I, I wanted to get your thoughts on sleep and wireless radiation, because I know in, in your bio, you talked about, um, or it might have not been in your bio, it might have been in an, in an article where they interviewed you. Um, you talked about insomnia, that you had some insomnia for a while, and you linked yes. it to, to your EMF. And so that's something I've dealt with for a really long time. Um, okay. Not just, you know, I think not just related to EMF, but also just a bunch of other factors, but I never really knew like the mechanism, like how does that work? So, okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, it's interesting. It started with light, learning about light, because like we said earlier, light is a form of electromagnetic radiation also. Mm -hmm. And you have a pathway that goes directly from your eye to your hypothalamus. It's called the retinohypothalamic tract. And that tells your brain whether or not the sun's out. Right. It's, it's not part of your visual system, but it actually just tells your brain, yes, the sun's in the sky or it's dark out. Mm -hmm. And when the brain is signaled that it's dark out, it tells the pineal gland to start producing and releasing melatonin, the sleep hormone, right? right? So uh, in a natural world, uh, aside from lighting a fire, as soon as the sun sets, it's dark out and your brain mm -hmm. is, you're kind of programmed to start getting tired and to go to sleep. And so during winter months in northern latitudes, your nights are very long, you produce a lot of melatonin. You don't produce much vitamin D because the sun is low in the sky, but the melatonin gives you that beneficial effect uh, to support your immune system that vitamin D can also do in a right. different way, but similar in, in respect. So by creating artificial sources of light indoors, we've increased the, the length of our daytime in, in a certain respe respect. Our brains don't know, especially if we have full spectrum indoor light or we have blue light coming from a screen, for example, uh, our brain is picking up those blue frequencies and it thinks that we're looking at a blue sky. It thinks that we're being, that the sun's still out in the sky. And so it delays your melatonin production. It can delay it for hours. So if you're looking at a screen or a TV or something before you go to bed, and then you click the TV off, you turn off your lights and you think that your body's ready for sleep, it isn't. <laughs> Yeah, it, it takes a while. I mean, think about the process of the sunset. It goes from a blue sky and then you have a red sky, right? Mm -hmm. You have the sunset. It's a beautiful shade of red. Well, that, that signals your body to start relaxing. The sun's setting, nighttime's coming, and you, you're, you have physiological changes that occur uh, during different periods of the day. It's called a circadian rhythm. And so by creating artificial sources of light, we've kind of altered that. Uh, now, throw in Wi-Fi and radio frequency radiation, it can affect the brain similarly. It tells the brain there's radiation coming and we shouldn't have any radiation coming into our, into our eyes or into our head once the sun sets. I mean, the, the only radiation we're exposed to, there's a very, very, very small field that we all emit, all living forms emit some radiation. Mm -hmm. And of course the earth has a very low vibration that uh, is concerned, uh, is considered um, a, a re, uh, electromagnetic frequency. Mm -hmm. But aside from that, we really shouldn't be exposed to any radio frequency radiation at all or light. Uh, so EMF, Wi-Fi, all this stuff can affect your brain and delay melatonin production also. Um, and so I, I noticed it firsthand and, and I feel it's foolish because I was studying this and yet I moved from a country house to a city house. Hmm. And when I moved into the city house, I didn't think that because my neighbors were only 10 feet away from me now on either side, that I would be affected by their Wi-Fi. Not only that, then a few months later, they installed a 5G antenna across the street. Oof. So I'm being, I, I was bombarded with uh, EMF. And I didn't put two and two together. I thought, well, because I was turning off my router at night and my cell phone was turned off and my kids' cell phones were turned off. And we, we've been doing that for many, many years. I still couldn't sleep. So I had uh, a professional known as a building biologist come into my house and he did a survey and he's the one who told me, oh, you've got all this coming in from your neighbors. I had a, a smart meter put on the house that was emitting uh, Wi-Fi to communicate with the, the uh, parent company. Uh, there was dirty electricity, which is another topic that was coming mm. in through the walls from, uh, from the Wi-Fi router and, and from other appliances in the house. Yeah. And so 
what I ended up doing was I bought a sleep canopy, which is in a sense, it's a Faraday cage. It's, it's infiltrated with copper and, and silver threads. And so the radio frequency radiation that hits it gets deflected. And, uh, and so on the interior of the sleeping space now, there's none, almost none. I, I'm right. reading, I've been told as long as your environment is less than 10 microwatts per meter squared, which is the unit that I use that my detector looks at microwatts per meter squared, as long as it's less than 10, it shouldn't affect your sleep. So mine now is around two to three, which is fine. And I sleep, I sleep perfectly. But before then, mm -hmm. it was in the hundreds, perhaps even going up to a thousand every now and then, I couldn't sleep. Interesting. Yeah. I, I mean, I think because I've known about EMF for a while and I've been conscious to turn my phone off or at least put it on airplane mode, put it out of my room every single night. Uh, my Wi-Fi router is, you know, a floor below. Um, even if it is not in your room, is that still something that can affect you? The Wi-Fi router? The Wi-Fi router, yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. And, it, and especially now, they're much more intense than they used to be. Uh, they, right. they, they put out a much, a much stronger signal, much greater amplitude than it used to be. So if you're interested, and it sounds like you are interested in this topic, I would yeah. recommend buying a detector. And then you're kind of taking the guesswork out of it. You can do a survey, right. see what you're being exposed to, and, uh, and then make modifications as needed. Do you recommend a specific one? I like the one called Safe and Sound Pro. Uh, Safe and Sound Pro 2, actually, it's okay. in second generation. Uh, it's a little bit more pricey than some of the others. There's Trifield, there's a, there's a lot of vendors. And, uh, but for me, like, I just did a research study where I went around uh, 35 different cities in Pennsylvania and I measured the radio frequency radiation on the main streets and I'm hoping to get that published. And so I used this, this meter that was a little bit more higher end. Okay. But I, I like to know that what I'm using is accurate or at least as accurate as it can be. Okay, okay. And let's say you have your Wi-Fi router turned off at night. Um, you talked about dirty electricity, which from my rough understanding, that's you know, kind of Wi-Fi being kind of shot out, or not Wi-Fi, uh, EMF being shot out from like uh, outlets. Um, yeah, it can yeah. actually come from the wiring in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the wall. So what happens okay. is whenever you have a dimmer switch where you're changing the, the current, uh, you can end up with what with, with these voltage potentials, uh, they're spikes, mm -hmm. and they travel along the wiring of your house and they emit radiation, just like, you know, just like the 50 or 60 hertz that we use, that emits electromagnetic, uh, an electromagnetic field, an electric field, and a magnetic field that's at 90 degrees access to it. So even the wiring in our house and through the outlets, if you have a detector, it's a different detector than the Safe and Sound Pro. Mm -hmm. uh, but that will also, you'll see that there are fields of energy that are coming out sometimes five or six feet into the middle of your, of your room from mm -hmm. wiring. The dirty electricity is a higher frequency. It's in the kilohertz range. So it's, exactly. not, it's not 50 or 60 hertz. It's in the kilohertz range. And it's much more bioactive from what I understand. Okay. Now, there, there's ways to remediate that also. Right. Yeah, I was going to ask you, uh, what, what are some ways other than obviously first step would be limiting your exposure, but that's something that most of us can't do with our jobs and, you know, being in school and things like that. So, so what are some easy steps to mitigate that? To mediate dirty electricity? or the, Yeah, or dirty electricity, general? just exposure in general also. So uh, starting with dirty electricity, uh, you can turn your power off at night. Mm -hmm. Some people do that. Yeah. You can install something called the green wave filter, or uh, there's another filter on the market that you can plug into outlets and it's supposed to neutralize the line. I, I don't use those. And I've been told that they don't neutralize the ground line, which can also become infiltrated with, uh, with these frequencies. So okay. what I did was I bought something called the sign tamer. Uh, and it was, it's a, I purchased it from a website called the power EMT, I think is the website. I heard the guy uh, lecture at a conference. He seemed very knowledgeable. And I tell you, after I installed it, I immediately felt better in the house. It was an immediate, uh, immediate improvement. Okay. So that's for dirty electricity, what I did. For uh, exposure, like I said, uh, in general, I, I personally believe as long as you have 
a solid block of time every day, like when you're sleeping, when you're not being bombarded with this, your body will heal. Hmm. Uh, it's not going to become, I think that you, and you take antioxidants, if you take antioxidants and you have at least seven or eight hours a day where you're not being exposed to this stuff, I think that you're going to be okay. I would hope. Uh, of course, it's a dynamic field. The technology keeps changing. They keep increasing, uh, you know, the amplitude of the of the frequencies they're they're sending out. So I can't say that's going to be true necessarily three months from now, but right. that's how I'm dealing with it now. Okay. Uh, I I don't recommend ever putting your cell phone up to your head. That I really don't recommend you do. Uh, yeah. It causes uh, an increase in temperature that's not limited to your skin. It, it can actually heat your brain. Hmm. Uh, and there is an association with brain tumors. Uh, so uh, I mean, there's been some controversy. I know people don't wanna hear that, but there is. There's some evidence that it increases risk for brain tumors. Uh, I always speak in speaker mode. I don't use Bluetooth. I don't put anything with electromagnetic field uh, frequencies in my ear because the ear canal communicates directly to your brain through your seventh and eighth cranial nerves. And so uh, there's a lot of people who are getting something called uh, schwannomas and acoustic neuromas or benign brain tumors of the, of the, of the cranial nerves that go to your ear. Yeah. And I believe that's from the Wi-Fi. So I always, yeah. and I never put the cell phone in my pocket. Men, uh, young, young men can, uh, the, the sperm can be, uh, uh, the motility can drastically reduce and sperm can actually die viability can, can be uh, reduced from exposure to a cell phone, even for just 20 minutes. Yep. So I never put an active cell phone in my pocket. Not that I want to have any more kids, <laughs> but if, I figure if it's doing that to the sperm cells, what else is it doing? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, the health of the testicle itself, right. And producing the testosterone. Yeah. Testosterone and, yeah. and just, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, all kinds of stuff, who knows there's, it's very, everything has a lot of functions uh, and there's a lot of different cell types. And so I, I just don't want to have, I just don't want that as an extra potential cause of, of damage. I also don't use electric seat warmers. I don't mm. use electric blankets. I don't use a, a heating pad. Uh, for women that have menstrual cramps, I do not recommend an electric heating pad. Use an old fashioned water bottle with hot water in it because the magnetic fields, the electromagnetic fields that are generated from these heating devices, they're strong and they can affect your physiology. Uh, now it's not, you know, we're not, there's no proof that prostate cancer and these things are being caused by uh, uh, these, these devices, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was some effect. Right, and, and again, it's like, we can say, association we can really only say association because like you said where's the control group where's the blinded trial it's just it's i mean i don't know how it would be possible to do that so right. what we got is, is epidemiology and associations right right yeah. exactly uh in terms of nutrition and like kind of mitigating this um through i know you mentioned antioxidants what would be like your top three eat organic that would be my, my top number one, two, and three. Uh, there's so many toxins in, in the food supply and, uh, you know, even produce. You know, you, mm -hmm. if you buy a, a conventional produce and also actually organic produce too, you need to wash it with a veggie wash or, or at least make your own that you're going to take the plastic, the wax layer off of your fruit and vegetables because the um, fungicides and the pesticides that they apply uh, and, and farms and for storage can, uh, when they become absorbed, they, they're toxins. Hmm. So you have to get that stuff off before you eat a piece of fruit or you have a vegetable. Okay. Uh, and then, you know, all these packaged foods, processed foods, um, they're laden with chemicals. They cause, they can cause disease also. So mm -hmm. you really want to limit your exposure to, to, to all things uh, chemical that, you know, made in a lab basically. And just eat regular food. Yeah. Uh, just eat food that's real, real yeah. food. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So, so number one, two, and three would be organic. Um, yeah. Is there? Because I know there are a ton of different types of antioxidants. Like I know some people recommend like glutathione. You know, vitamin C. That's NAC. the master. Yeah. Yes. Right. Glutathione is the master antioxidant. The NAC is uh, N-acetylcysteine is what it stands for, and it, it is used to create 
which generate more glutathione. So it's also really good, especially for people with COVID because it's a great, it's right. great for the respiratory epithelium. Yeah. Uh, but, I, but other than that, they all have a role. Uh, I'm sure they're all used for different processes and they're, they're valuable for different, in different circumstances. So no, I couldn't say, oh, well, I would recommend eating blueberries or, you know, right. I would just say have a variety, whatever yeah. you feel like eating, eat, as long as you wash it. Uh, with a fruit and veggie wash and you eat organic. Right. Yeah. I, I know there's also some uh, research that I, that I read from the Environmental Health Trust about uh, omega-3s. What are your thoughts on, you know, consuming omega-3s for kind of mitigating this inflammatory effect of VMS? Well, you know, that, yeah, for some membranes and, and you need fatty acids. And if you have damage, you need to have fats that are that are, uh, you need to supply your, your body with, with good fats and good right. oils. So yes, I think they're, they're good. I, I, I take fatty acids and um, omega-3s, uh, I do. And I, yeah. when, I, when I have fish, I mean, I, you know, fish is, is tricky because of course there's mercury uh, contamination in some species of fish more than mm-hmm. others. But as, I think as long as you limit your consumption of fish to once a week, you're probably okay. Right. Uh, I got in trouble with somebody from uh, one of the government organizations saying that I, I don't recommend for farm raised fish, yeah. uh, but they were saying that sometimes farm raised fish are healthier than, than the wild caught. I, I don't know if that's true or not, but I always try to buy wild caught fish. Yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. I think the real problem could lie if you're like eating tuna steaks every single day. Right. I mean, go for the small fish too, because they're also richer in omega threes, like the sardines, the anchovies, mackerel. Yeah. Absolutely. Those Absolutely. are amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I've had to get over the taste, but <laughs> I kind of like them. <laughs> Absolutely. Though the smaller fish don't bioaccumulate quite so much, you know? Right. Right. Um, in terms of, of shielding, you mentioned like the shielding canopy. Uh, that's something I've looked into, but they're just, they're so expensive. The ones that are already made, do you know if like, can you make it yourself, like buy some sort of material there or? Um. I, you know, I just found one uh, and I don't, you know, uh, I don't like to mark other people's material, but uh, Dr. Mercola uh, has, okay. uh, I think it's Mercola um, store. I think it's MercolaStore.com. He's got one that's relatively inexpensive. I think it's about $500 that you can sleep in. Okay. And it's, it's like, a, it's, it's, it's not really a canopy, but it's more like a cocoon that it's big enough that you can actually sleep in it. Okay. And I just bought a couple to try them out, but I have a, a, a friend that, that recommended it. So I figured when I'm traveling, uh, I would, I would uh, maybe try that instead. Okay. Sweet. But yeah, they are expensive. Can you make it? It's not just fabric. It's right. the fabric is, is, uh, is weaved with these, with these metal threads. If you don't have the metal threads, it's just a piece of fabric. Yeah. So no, you can't just, it's not, it's not something that you can make without the fabric. Yeah, you know, yeah, that's something that I feel like is is probably a since it's still kind of a niche market, the the shielding canopies and things, it's still pretty expensive, harder to to get accessible to to more people, especially yes. the ones who probably need it the most, right? Like people living in in really polluted big cities, you know, and, and lower uh, socioeconomic status. Oh, I'm right? getting a problem with your audio and your your visio froze on me. Oh no. Can you hear me now? Uh-oh. Oh no. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me now? I can hear you now, but yeah, there was a okay. problem. Your video froze. Oh man, okay. I hear you now. Okay, perfect, perfect. Um, yeah, so before we go, um, where can people find out more about you and your work? Uh, my website is robbrownmd.com. Uh, so I do post uh, new new blogs every now and then on there. I do have a newsletter that comes out occasionally. I don't write all the time, but I suppose that's probably the best way to keep up with what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do post on Facebook occasionally, also Rob Brown MD. Uh, but I think the website's probably the best way to keep up with me. I don't spam. I'm not going to send anybody's you know information to a third party, so don't worry about that. Uh, but yeah, no, I think it's. Um, and I'm actually going to be uh, putting on a course. I'm teaching it an adult education class now at uh, Carnegie Mellon here in Pittsburgh. And it's, uh, 
it's uh, five one and a half hour sessions and it's all about EMF and I'm going to record a 10 uh, episode series that I'm going to put on my website, uh, hopefully by the end of the year about this to cover all of this so people will just be able to listen to it and, and get it. Perfect. Yeah, I'll, I'll link to, to those in, in the description and the show notes. Um, thank you very much for your time. I learned a lot. Terrific. Yeah, I enjoyed it. And I'm so glad you're interested in the topic. It, I think it's really important too. So. Oh, it absolutely is. It's not talked about enough. <laughs> Great. Well, good luck and uh, thank you very much. You got Be, it. Stay in touch.